Hi, I'm Jim Smyrniotopoulos, and we're going to be talking about CNS infections. Putting this uh, lecture together, I had a lot of help from my friends, especially Alice Smith and Stephen Goldstein. I have no significant financial or other disclosures related to the content of this talk. Our learning objectives, to describe the host versus pathogen interactions, to distinguish meningitis from subdural empyema, to describe the complication of CNS abscesses, to distinguish inflammatory encephalitis from stroke, and to talk about fungal vasculitis. There are many types of infection. Bacteria can be intracellular or extracellular. They can be interstitial, and they can fill a cavity. That's an empyema full of pus. Viral infections usually involve direct intracellular destruction. Fungi are usually extracellular. They may be interstitial or they may fill a cavity. Parasitic infections can be interstitial. They can be in a cavity, but they can also be intracellular. And the examples of that are toxoplasmosis and malaria. Prion diseases are abnormally folded proteins and they are directly inside of the cell. What prevents us from getting infections? We have defensive barriers, the epithelium of the skin and the gut lining. We have mucus, saliva, and other bacteriostatic secretions. The ability to get infected is also related to the size of the inoculum and the virulence of the organism. The host competence and immunity is also going to affect it. Is this a new organism or one to which we've been previously exposed and have acquired immunity? Innate immunity is also related to something called pathogen-associated molecular patterns, and these are built into our genome. And again, the physical barriers, the antimicrobial uh, peptides and reactive oxygen species that we see, innate immune cells that react to everything, and soluble mediators like complement and innate antibodies and cytokines. In terms of imaging, infections in the same space look very similar. Epi and subdural empyema, meningitis, abscess, ventriculitis, regardless of the organism, are going to have a similar appearance on imaging. The organism prevalence varies with the patient age, immune status, and geographic locale. Basilar meningitis is most likely to be TB or fungal. Most viruses and prions affect neurons, so there's going to be a localization in the gray matter. Herpes affects the cortex primarily, but some viruses like West Nile are, and Japanese encephalitis affect the thalamus, and CJD, the prion, is also going to affect the thalamus and the basal ganglia. PML is actually caused by an infection of the oligodendrocytes much more than the astrocytes, and so that's going to be localized to the white matter. So let's start out with localizing the infection. Remembering that infections in the same physical space may look similar regardless of the organism. These are all extraaxial infections, epidural empyema, ventriculitis, subarachnoid space infection, subdural infection, and meningeal infection or meningitis. Intraaxial localization includes cerebritis organizing into an abscess, parasitic infections, encephalitis involving the gray matter, and demyelinating disease involving the white matter, and that's likely to be PML. So let's start out talking more about extraaxial infection. If we have the thick meninges, the dura enhancing, that's pachymeningeal enhancement, and that spares the sulci. If we have enhancement in the sulci, that's the skinny meninges or leptomeningeal enhancement. And if we have an empyema, we may have enhancement on the outside or pachymeningeal side, as well as the skinny meninges or leptomeningeal side of the fluid collection. Whenever we have an empyema, whether it's subdural or epidural, they're typically caused by spread from an adjacent infection in the paranasal sinuses or the mastoids. For epidural infection, we want to look for an associated osteomyelitis. Subdural fluid collections generally don't cross the midline, Epidural fluid collections may dissect the meningeal layer of the dura away from the periosteal layer of the dura, and they can cross the midline. If we see here, we peel back the dura, and there is this yellowish pus un underneath the dura and on top of the arachnoid membrane, not filling the sulci. And 
If we look here, we want to always watch for the associated occurrence of a osteomyelitis or POTS puffy tumor when we have an epidural empyema or epidural abscess. Subdural empyemas will displace the enhancing brain and meningeal enhancement if the patient has meningitis away from the inner table of the skull, and they generally have the typical, typical shape of a subdural collection being concave towards the brain. Subdural effusions and empyema can occur as a result of a patient having meningitis. The mortality for these can be high, 2 to 12 percent. The treatment is antibiotics and drainage. And subdural effusions are very common in children who have H. flu meningitis, and they can be sterile. They don't have to be. How do we distinguish subdural empyema from subdural effusions? When we have a subdural empyema, we typically have enhancement of the overlying pachymeninges, the dura. The signal of the fluid collection is going to deviate from CSF, and we're going to expect to have restricted diffusion from the pus, which is going to be dark on ADC and bright on the diffusion-weighted image. In contrast, when we have a subdural effusion, we may see underlying leptomeningeal enhancement, but typically the overlying dura does not enhance. The signal can be quite similar to CSF, although sometimes there is protein, and the diffusion will not be restricted on ADC and DWI imaging. If the patient has H. flu uh, meningitis, they may develop a subdural effusion or empyema. Let's look at this five-year-old boy who presents with a barking cough and fever. The fever has worsened and the patient now has had a febrile seizure. His temperature is 102. If we look at a pair of these images, T1 and T2, we can see an extra axial collection displacing the sulci away from the inner table of the skull. Once we give gadolinium contrast enhancement, we can see enhancement on the surface of the brain, and this is going to be leptomeningeal enhancement, but it's difficult to see whether there is any overlying pachymeningeal enhancement. So this could be a subdural effusion. On the coronal image, again, we can see enhancement along the surface of the brain under the fluid collection, but not over the top, which would be pachymeningeal enhancement. Some of the sulci also show contrast enhancement and some don't, indicating that the patient does have a leptomeningeal infection or meningitis. So just as a review, the empyema should be bright on the DWI. The empyema may have enhancement all the way around. If it's only an effusion, the enhancement should only be underneath in the arachnoid membrane. But in this particular patient, when diffusion imaging was done, it actually demonstrates restricted diffusion. So now we know that this patient actually has a subdural empyema and not a sympathetic effusion from their H. flu meningitis. Subdural empyemas are, are an uncommon complication of community-acquired meningitis. Predisposing factors include otitis and sinusitis spreading into the subdural space. The majority of patients have neurologic signs or symptoms. The organisms are, are typically going to be a, a strep species. And patients who have neurologic deficits need to have drainage, either open or using a burr hole. Let's look at another patient, an 18-year-old woman who developed new onset of seizures about one month before this study was performed. So she now has two weeks of fever and a frontal headache, an elevated white count, primarily neutrophils. On the cross-sectional imaging, we can see an extra axial fluid collection, surprisingly large for the patient's relatively minor symptoms. We can see there is enhancement all the way around this extra axial fluid collection, strongly suggestive of it being an empyema and not an effusion. Again, the coronal image demonstrates enhancement all the way around the fluid collection, strongly suggesting it is a subdural empyema. And of course, the icing on the cake is to demonstrate that the lesion is bright on DWI and dark on ADC, indicating that we have restricted diffusion. This was drained, and we can see on the post-operative image, there's still some minimal contrast enhancement in the sulci, as well as in the residual fluid collection. Let's now turn our attention to meningitis. Meningitis typically demonstrates contrast enhancement between the pia and the arachnoid. This is caused by contrast leaking out of inflamed vessels directly into the subarachnoid space. There should also be increased flare signal in the subarachnoid space in addition to the enhancement in the sulci.
The most common causes of meningitis are going to be viral, much, much, much more commonly than bacterial. And we also want to remember that patients can have chemical or carcinomatous meningitis that will cause contrast enhancement and abnormal flare signal within the sulfur. The organisms that cause meningitis vary with the patient's age. CSF sampling is much more sensitive than imaging in diagnosing meningitis. The pus that's in the subarachnoid space can cause a thrombophlebitis and either arterial or more likely venous infarction. So most commonly meningitis is caused by viral. There are sporadic uh, episodic individual cases and not an epidemic. Bacterial meningitis, however, may spread to become epidemic meningitis. And meningitis, bacterial meningitis, can be spread through intimate contact, through sharing utensils, sharing cigarettes, and, and close uh, contact uh, less than three to six feet away. What are the causes of viral meningitis? Well, the most common cause in the U.S. are enteroviruses, and this is much more common in the summer. And this includes Coxsackie and echoviruses, non-polio enterovirus, and hand, foot, and mouth disease. Measles, influenza, and mumps can also cause viral meningitis. Herpes viruses may cause viral meningitis, as well as insect-borne arboviruses and lymphocytic choriomeningitis, which can be spread by rodents. We'll talk about bacterial meningitis first. So bacterial meningitis organisms vary with the age of the patient. Newborns typically have group B strep, strep pneumonia, listeria, and Escherichia coli or E. coli. Older adults can also have uh, strep species, but they can have Neisseria, Haemophilus uh, type B, and they can also have listeria. Babies and children, again, strep pneumonia, Neisseria, uh, H. flu, and streptococcus. Teens and young adults uh, tend to have Neisseria meningitides and streptococcus pneumonia. The complications of uh, meningitis and the symptoms, uh, patients tend to have fever, nuchal rigidity, altered mental status. They may have either Koenig's or Brzezinski's sign. They typically have a dramatically elevated white count over a thousand. Uh, CSF is the most sensitive and specific test. CT is falsely negative and about two-thirds of children, but MR is much more sensitive with a false negative rate of only about one-third. Uh, about 40% of children will have complications that will be detected on imaging, including about 76% having a subdural effusion. So what does meningitis look like? On the CT scan here, we can see abnormal enhancement in the basal or cisterns extending around the brainstem in the ambient or perimesencephalic cistern. Again, the contrast material is in the subarachnoid space and it should enter and fill the sulci as well as the basal or cisterns. The meningitis patterns include the pachymeningeal pattern that we can see illustrated here on the left of the slide, and this was an asymptomatic patient with a postoperative infection. But the classic or typical pattern for meningitis is leptomeningeal enhancement with enhancement going into the sulci, very, very nicely demonstrated here. And the flare image also shows abnormally high signal intensity within the sulci. So there's two different ways that we can identify the inflammation of the subarachnoid space with contrast and on flare without giving contrast material. So when we have contrast in the subarachnoid space, that's abnormal. Contrast normally doesn't leak into the subarachnoid space. It can be infectious meningitis, bacterial, fungal, or viral, but it can also be chemical meningitis that occurs after subarachnoid hemorrhage or from a ruptured dermoid or epidermoid teratoma or a craniopharyngioma. And again, we can have neoplastic meningitis with CSF dissemination. Complications of meningitis include hydrocephalus. Basically, you're either gumming up the flow of CSF in the subarachnoid space or you're plugging up the arachnoid granulations. Subdural effusions and empyema, as we have already seen. We can also have complications that are intraaxial or parenchymal, cerebritis and abscess, ventriculitis and ependymitis. And again, because of the thrombophlebitis, we can have arterial or venous infarction and thrombosis of the large dural sinuses, leading to edema, mass effect, and herniation.
Let's now talk about intraaxial parenchymal infections, cerebritis and abscess. Cerebritis is oftentimes visualized as ill-defined edema. As the infection organizes, we develop an abscess, which may have an enhancing rim. When we have an abscess, we talk about a T2 hypointensity, and we also talk about internals of that, a slight hyperintensity, which is called the double rim sign. The classic description of an abscess is that the pus in the center of the enhancing ring is going to have restricted diffusion. What causes an abscess? It can be direct spread from an adjacent infection. It can be hematogenous. It can be iatrogenic, uh, the result of surgery. It can be the result of penetrating trauma. And in about 25% of cases, no source is identified. But again, the classic or typical appearance is going to be a ring enhancing lesion with central restricted diffusion from the viscosity and the intact white cells in the pus. If we talk about a hematogenous infection, this is a patient that had endocarditis. These valve vegetations harbored the bacteria, which are then embolized into the systemic circulation. Uh, patients may also have uh, bronchitis, sinusitis, as a cause of uh, CNS hematogenous dissemination of the infection. Let's talk about the progression of parenchymal infection. Early cerebritis is typically described as being uh, three to five days out from the beginning of the infection. There's no capsule. Late cerebritis extends out to approximately two weeks. There may be a very poorly defined rim without collagen and an necrotic core. Abscess formation begins to occur with the formation of a fibrous collagenous capsule, the proliferation of small vessels, granulation tissue, which surround a necrotic core, and it may have relatively mild mass effect. And the late capsule stage around an abscess, weeks to months, has a thick capsule, and edema and proportionate mass effect begin to resolve. If we look here at these uh, images, we can see multiple ring enhancing lesions, daughter abscesses surrounding vasogenic edema, and foci of restricted diffusion on the DWI image. One of the complications of having an abscess is the budding off of a daughter abscess as the infection spreads through the capsule into the adjacent brain. On gross pathology, abscesses are typically round and smooth and regular, convex all the way around the rim. There is oftentimes some surrounding intraaxial vasogenic edema. They have restricted diffusion on imaging. Uh, and if we look at this gross picture here, we can see what may be the explanation for the double rim sign shown on MR. We have an outer pinkish rim here, which is the granulation tissue and the fibrous collagenous ca capsule. And then inner to that, we have some relatively thick pus. And then this example shows what appears to be liquefaction in the center. Abscesses, again, are the classic lesion that shows restricted diffusion. They're going to be very bright on the diffusion-weighted image, as shown here. The explanation for that is probably that there are a lot of cells there, and restricted diffusion is a characteristic of highly cellular lesions, like a acute hematoma, the pus in an abscess. But there are many other causes of restricted diffusion. And again, beautiful rad path correlation, except that these are two different patients. So abscesses, again, tend to have a round and smooth shape, restricted diffusion that we look for, and a hypo-intense rim seen on the T2-weighted MR, and sometimes we can identify the double rim sign. There's a lot of explanations for the hypo-intense rim. Some people say that it's magnetic susceptibility. Some people say it's collagen. Uh, we can argue amongst ourselves to figure out our favorite uh, explanation. Here's an abscess that has a thin rim, but it has an undulating contour on the outside, and that might give pause to suggest that it is a neoplasm or an abscess. But the restricted diffusion is very characteristic of an abscess isn't it? and is not very common in a necrotic neoplasm. So this abscess dual rim sign is something we should look for. It's seen in about 75% of abscesses, and it's uncommon in other ring enhancing lesions. It's seen on SWI as well as T2-weighted imaging. The outer rim is hypo-intense, and there's a slightly hyper-intense rim internal to that. This is an example from the literature, again demonstrating the double rim sign, that there is an outer hypo-intense and an inner hyper-intense 
rim around the area of the puck. Abscess wall formation and the shape of the rim, the timing, the enhancement are all subject to the nature of the infectious organism and the response from the host. As we see here, pyogenic bacterial abscess has a classic appearance, but in the center is a patient who has abscesses from toxoplasmosis, which is an obligate intracellular parasite. And we can see it has a very, very irregular pattern of contrast enhancement. And in a abscess caused by aspergillus, we have very, very faint contrast enhancement and relatively little mass effect. So remember that abscesses don't always look the classic appearance, which is a bacterial pyogenic abscess. A classic distinction between a ring lesion representing a necrotic abscess and a GBM is that the necrotic neoplasm has a very thick and irregular wall, and the cavity is not going to show restricted diffusion. This is a long laundry list of things that cause ring enhancing lesions. Some people like to say magic doctor, some people like to say magic doctor T. Uh, and again, we have this list of things in our differential diagnosis. I wanted to point out here that when you have an infarct involving the basal ganglia, you can sometimes have ring enhancement around the outside. The anatomic localization of the enhancing rim should be a suspicion uh, for it not being a neoplasm or an abscess, as well as the patient's history of having a known uh, acute event consistent with a stroke. So ring enhancing lesions, classically smooth rim for an abscess, irregular shaggy inner margin for a neoplasm, and we have a variety of other patterns that can be caused by fluid secreting tumors, and also tumefactive demyelination can give us a partial ring enhancing lesion. I want to share with you how useful the DWI image can be. On the left-hand panel, we have an abscess where we have pus causing uh, increased signal in DWI. On the right side, we have a ring-enhancing lesion, which has a thin rim, a smooth rim, completely convex all the way around, surrounding vasogenic edema, and this looks very much like an abscess, but this does not have restricted diffusion. This is a GBM pathologically proven with necrosis. So abscesses don't always have restricted diffusion. But it's very useful to look for that if you think it's an abscess and to expect to have dissolution of cells and increased diffusion when you have a necrotic neoplasm. The differential diagnosis for restricted diffusion, aside from having gray matter uh, hyperintensity on the diffusion weighted image, is abscesses, epidermoid inclusion cysts, highly cellular tumors like a meningioma shown here with an atypical uh, intraaxial cyst. Various kinds of demyelinating lesions can have restricted diffusion. Choroid plexus xanthogranulomas can have restricted diffusion. And viruses replicating in the gray matter, like in this case of herpes encephalitis, can also have restricted diffusion. Also remember that an acute hematoma with intact red cells is going to have restricted diffusion. And always be careful to think about T2 shine through that can occur with a hematoma. And you can also have restricted diffusion with Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. We must be careful to watch for the complications of abscesses, the formation of daughter abscesses, mass effect, herniation and rupture of the abscess causing pyocephalus, ependymitis, choroid plexitis, and possibly secondary meningitis. If we have intraventricular rupture, we're going to have pyocephalus and ventricular infection of the choroid plexus, and that can also spill into the subarachnoid space. Illustrated here is rupture from an occipital lobe abscess into the ventricle. We've now developed periventricular ependymal enhancement from the ependymitis, and we can also see here that there is infection in the interpeduncular cistern and pus in the dependent portions of the occipital horns of the lateral ventricles. So why do we get pyocephalus and why do we get daughter abscesses? Well, the abscess wall is formed by the proliferation of small vessels, granulation tissue, and collagen is formed from fibroblasts in the vessel wall. The granulation tissue is generally thicker on the gray matter side and thinner on the white matter or ventricular side of the abscess. The reason for this disparity is that we have to recruit the pre-existing vessels to make the abscess wall. And the gray matter has four times the vascularity of the underlying white matter, and it makes a thicker wall, and it makes it faster than we see on the white matter side.
So once again here, we see this occipital lobe abscess with a daughter abscess. This ruptured into the ventricular system, giving us pus in the dependent portion of both lateral ventricles. We can see again faint rim enhancement caused by the ependymitis, the ependymal inflammation around the occipital horn. And very nicely demonstrated in the coronal image is this circumferential enhancement around the frontal horn of the ventricle from the ependymal infection from the ependymitis. So these are all complications of the abscess rupturing into the ventricular system. Let's now turn our attention to encephalitis and the discussion of viruses. Uh, some viruses have a tropism for certain parts of the brain. We'll discuss that as we go along. The tropism is generally to neurons, but different neurons uh, exhibit different sensitivities, if you will, for viral infection. So we can have a new infection or reactivation of a latent infection. We can also have an autoimmune reaction to a viral infection because of cross-reactivity between viral antigens and cell surface antigens. The most common causes of viral encephalitis, unlike viral meningitis, are going to be herpes species. Herpes simplex 1 or labialis and HSV2 or herpes genitalis. Uh, herpes zoster, the virus that causes uh, chicken pox and shingles. Uh, herpes type 5 causes cytomegalovirus infection. And we can also have, again, measles, mumps, rubella, equine encephalitis, West Nile, Japanese, and tick-borne uh, or flavor viridae viruses, as well as, unfortunately, rabies, which fortunately is very, very uncommon. These are going to give us enhancement in the gray matter structures and restricted diffusion in the gray matter structures, whether it be the deep gray matter or the superficial or cortical gray matter. That's going to be a sign of having a viral uh, infection. So let's take a case here, a 21-year-old soldier deployed to Iraq, found down in the barracks three days after being treated for a nonspecific respiratory viral illness. We can see here a gross disparity from side to side. We have uh, edema and swelling of the patient's left temporal lobe. We have a little bit of what appears to be enhancement in the sulci, but that could also be uh, artifactual because of the brain edema uh, highlighting uh, uh, residual cortex having a normal attenuation in the uh, surface of the brain. I, again here we have a, a diffusely swollen temporal lobe. The differential diagnosis for this with a different clinical presentation might be an MCA territory infarction. Uh, very dramatic here, uh, the swelling of all the gray matter, relative preservation of the normal signal of the underlying white matter. And again, here on the coronal image, we have abnormal gray matter in a non-vascular distribution. Abnormal gray matter is almost always caused by ischemia slash infarction, sometimes by seizures, but also by viral encephalitis. The difference between the vascular causes and the non-vascular causes has to do with localization of the abnormality to a known vascular territory. So we have here, uh, abnormality in the territory, the gray matter, and the MCA. But remember, the posterior cerebral artery supplies the undersurface of the temporal lobe. The anterior choroidal artery supplies the medial portion of the temporal lobe. And we also have involvement of two other vascular territories from the patient's opposite hemisphere. So this is not likely to be a vascular cause. This is most likely going to be a viral encephalitis. Again here, we can have a cytotoxic edema, and this cytotoxic edema is demonstrated on both sides, but our eye is caught by the massive abnormality of the patient's left temporal lobe, and we fail to recognize that there is also abnormality involving the medial aspect of the temporal lobe on the patient's right side. In working up a patient with suspected viral encephalitis, we could consider doing a brain biopsy, but we can learn a lot by sampling the CSF. If the patient has low glucose, that suggests a bacterial infection. That would also be supported by having an elevation white count in the CSF uh, composed mostly of polys. Protein elevation is nonspecific, 
A normal CSF glucose with few lymphocytes would suggest a viral infection, and you can also do PCR on the CSF. And every hospital has their own panel of uh, PCR that they look for. But you could look for the, uh, the common suspects, uh, herpes virus, CMV, Epstein-Barr virus, etc., when you do the CSF assay. So you don't have to do a brain biopsy to diagnose the etiology or cause when you suspect the patient has a viral encephalitis. So we get back to our patient here. He did have CSF drawn and the PCR was positive for herpes simplex virus. The patient had a 14-day course of IV acyclovir. Uh, he remained aphasic but otherwise responded well to the therapy. So let's talk more about viral encephalitis. It's relatively uncommon. There, there's probably less than 10 cases per 100,000 people per year. Uh, there are different exposures and different kinds of viruses. We can have an acute exposure in a newborn whose mother has uh, herpes genitalis infection. We can have a latent viral infection that is asymptomatic that becomes reactivated. That's typically what happens when adults get herpes encephalitis. And the viral encephalitides are primarily localized to the gray matter, and the enhancement in the cytotoxic edema is going to be localized to the gray matter. So how do we get the infections? Well, the virus enters the body. It might enter the body as a respiratory source. It might enter the body by passing through the birth canal. There's endocytosis, and the virus transits the cytoplasm into the endoplasmic reticulum. Then it penetrates the nucleus and hijacks the DNA mechanisms. Generally, viral replication causes cell lysis, and that gives you cytotoxic edema. But if the virus is dormant within the patient's nucleus, then we won't see an abnormality until the virus is reactivated. And we think that that's the cause of most cases of herpes encephalitis and also progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy caused by the JC virus. It's also possible for viral genetic material to be permanently incorporated into human DNA. In fact, there are estimates that 10 to 20 percent of human DNA is actually incorporated from viral infections through our uh, evolution. The cortical neurons are infected by herpes species most commonly. The deep gray matter, uh, especially the thalamus, is a target for West Nile, Eastern equine encephalitis, and Japanese encephalitis. Oligodendrocytes are the target for JC virus that causes PML, and both neurons and astrocytes can be infected by the virus that causes HIV. Let's now turn our attention to HIV encephalitis. These patients may present with a progressive dementia. Imaging typically shows uh, evidence of volume loss or atrophy with enlarged ventricles and sulci out of proportion to the patient's age. HIV directly infects the neurons, causing neuronal loss, but there's also the suggestion of toxic viral proteins and immune-mediated effects. Uh, and uh, HIV encephalitis is less common now because of the application of highly active antiretroviral therapy. So HIV is a retrovirus. It integrates into our human DNA. And about 5 to 8% of all human DNA is actually human endogenous retroviruses other than HIV. The primary CNS infection is in neurons. There's also immune-mediated damage, and patients are known to have elevated cerebral quinolinic acid, which is a neurotoxin, approximately 300 times higher than normal in the brain. And again, the patients present with a progressive dementia and volume loss, which we tend to call atrophy, uh, in quotation marks. So this is a 42-year-old male patient, and the brain looks like an 85-year-old patient. We see uh, bilaterally symmetric ventricular enlargement and enlargement of the sulci out of proportion and discordant with the patient's age. This is a typical presentation with symmetric atrophy for a patient with HIV encephalitis. An MR in a different patient also shows the same pattern of symmetric atrophy involving both sides involving the periventricular area as well as the cortical gray matter. While we're talking about immune suppressed patients, we also need to talk about progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, 
which presents in this group. This is actually caused by reactivation of a latent virus called the John Cunningham virus after the first patient from which it was isolated. The JC virus is ubiquitous and worldwide. The prevalence of exposure to this is 70 to 90 percent among humans. It remains dormant or latent in the kidney, lymphocytes, and perhaps in the brain's microglia. It can become reactivated when patients are immune suppressed for any reason, and it causes a lysis of oligodendrocytes and demyelination. So it's going to occur in the same patients who have HIV, but it has a very different imaging appearance. It typically forms focal lesions that are asymmetric that extend right up to the gray matter and then stop. So PML was first described pathologically in 1958. The JC virus was identified in a patient with Hodgkin's disease in 1971. Again, the prevalence of this uh, seroprevalence is, is almost 90% uh, or more in healthy adults. We shed this virus in our urine. About three quarters of us may do that. And again, the pathogenesis is we have a subclinical infection in childhood that is asymptomatic. The JC virus becomes latent, and then it is reactivated and disseminates, and it has a tropism for the brain because it infects the oligodendrocytes. So what does it look like on imaging? We typically have lesions that have no mass effect whatsoever. Contrast enhancement is very, very uncommon, and the lesions characteristically involve the white matter. They extend right up to the gray matter and stop, and they may also involve the corpus callosum. They do not have the periventricular pattern, and they don't have small focal lesions, as we would see in a patient that has multiple sclerosis. Sometimes we can also see restricted diffusion in the lesions of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy caused by infection with the JC virus. So no mass and no enhancement, typical for uh, PML and the JC virus. This coronal section illustrates how the lesion spares the periventricular area, but goes right up to the gray matter and, and stops. The JC virus comes from the Popova polyoma virus family. We can do uh, PCR assays on CSF to demonstrate the JC antigen indicating an active infection. And although PML typically caused death within six months, we now know that patients can survive for many years uh, if the patients are getting highly aggressive antiretroviral therapy. So multifocal leukoencephalopathy, PML, little or no mass effect, little or no contrast enhancement, rapidly progressing, uh, and it spares the gray matter, but it may involve the corpus callosum. Here's another example here. Again, this geographic lesion that comes right up to the gray matter and stops that we can see on T1, proton density, and uh, T2 weighted images. We can see companion images, coronal MR and coronal gross brain from a patient who did die, this uh, granular atrophy that we have here in the white matter with complete sparing of the overlying cortical gray matter. This is a myelin stain, uh, and we can see here these large geographic patchy areas of demyelination caused by the lysis of oligodendrocytes that are infected by the JC virus. We can also see the viral particles replicating inside of the cell. That's what's illustrated here. The viral particles on electron microscopy. And some people say that this appearance uh, of the viral particles and also these linear structures here is the spaghetti and meatballs appearance of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. We can do a head-to-head -head comparison of HIV versus PML. HIV, again, is symmetric and primarily periventricular. PML is going to give us asymmetric lesions that are more peripheral beginning at the gray matter, but may also involve the corpus callosum. Let's turn our attention to sister sarcosis, which is the most common worldwide cause of seizures. Humans host the adult tapeworm. Eggs are shed in feces. Pigs eat human poop. The eggs hatch into larvae in the pig's gut. The larvae insist in the pig muscle. That's called measly pork. And then humans eat undercooked infected pork.
But how do we get central nervous system cystocercosis? Well, we know it occurs, and this is the vesicular stage of cystocercosis. And what you see is that there is a scolex which is the living larva, surrounds itself with this clear fluid, and that prevents the body from having an immune reaction. When the scolex dies, the fluid disappears, we begin to see vasogenic edema and contrast enhancement, and that's when the patients typically will present with seizures. So like most parasites, cystocercosis has a complex life cycle involving the definitive host, the adult host, the secondary host, and also the possibility for fecal contamination. There's almost always someone eating poop in the life cycle of a parasite. So humans are the definitive host of the tapeworm. The larval form is insisted in the pork. If humans eat raw or undercooked meat, then we get the larval form in our gut and then the larval form becomes the adult worm in our gut. However, if there is human fecal contamination to another human, then we're going to get the larval form in humans, and that will insist in muscle that may migrate to the central nervous system. So avoid eating poop at all costs. The four stages of cystocercosis include the vesicular stage we just saw, the colloidal stage when the scolex or larva begins to die, the granular stage when the fluid begins to disappear and we get small enhancing nodules without much edema. And then the nodular calcified stage where the cyst completely involutes, there's a calcification and there's no edema or contrast enhancement. Cystocercosis can also be extraventricular as well as being intraventricular. Again, this is the vesicular form in the occipital horns, in the subarachnoid space of the spinal cord, and in the cisterns and subarachnoid space inside the calvarium. This is what the vesicles look like with the clear fluid and the living part or the larva inside the clear fluid. So cystocercosis is the most common parasitic infection of the central nervous system, and it's a worldwide leading cause of epilepsy, especially in developing countries. Let's finish up by talking about fungi or fungi. These are ubiquitous saprophytes. Aspergillus and mucor are angioinvasive and are complicated by hemorrhage, thrombosis, and infarction. And these patients may have subacute, prolonged, or a chronic clinical course. Fungi are everywhere. Most require some kind of a host problem in order to cause a human infection. Some underlying chronic illness, especially diabetes, allergies, and bronchitis, or immune deficiency. They can spread by direct extension from an adjacent sinal infect, sinus infection, or there can be hematogenous dissemination from foci within the lung. The clinically most important fungal infections are the angioinvasive fungi, aspergillus, and mucor species. These directly invade through vessel walls. They may cause vessel wall enhancement. The fungus makes an elastase, which digests the vessel wall, which may cause aneurysms. There can be thrombosis causing infarction or rupture of the aneurysm causing a hemorrhage. Aspergillus imaging will show a predilection for the basilar parts of the brain. The basal ganglia vessels are invaded by the fungi, also the corpus callosum. 
We get non-territory infarctions and hemorrhage. Remember, the fungal elastase eats the vessel wall, and we can get mycotic aneurysms that can produce a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Many fungi produce low signal on MR. People have suggested that this is due to the presence of hemorrhage or paramagnetic iron, manganese, or calcium. There is a minimal uh, to weak enhancement, but not the bright homogeneous enhancement that we typically expect. Again, aspergillus is angioinvasive. We can see here this clearly defined lesion. Uh, we see the hypointensity on the T2-weighted image, and we see faint contrast enhancement. Remember that the fungal elastase eats the internal vessel lamina. This is a path picture here demonstrating multiple foci of abnormal hemorrhage from the fungal digestion of the vessel wall. And again, note that the corpus callosum is involved. That can be a helpful sign suggesting that we have aspergillus infection. So why do we call it aspergillus? Well, the fruiting head of the fungus actually looks like an aspergillum. The aspergillum, if you remember, is what the Pope uses to spray the holy water. So this is what it looks like on a scanning electron microscopy, and this is what it looks like when Pope Francis is using it to bless the crowd. So whenever you think about the Pope and you see him blessing people, think about the shape of the fruiting head that we have in Aspergillus. Let's summarize what we had a chance to talk about. When imaging meningitis and abscess, watch for the complications of empyema and pyocephalus. The history of the patient, especially their immune status and history of travel are extremely important. And remember that the appearance of an infection may also vary with immune status. Immune suppressed people may not have a florid reaction and may have diminished contrast enhancement. The basic principles, infections in the same space look similar. Organism prevalence varies with patient age, immune status, and geographic locale. Basilar meningitis is likely to be TB and fungal. Most viruses and prions affect neurons, so they're gonna localize themselves to the gray matter. PML is a white matter disease because it's a direct infection of the oligodendrocytes. And in immune suppressed patients, IV drug abusers, HIV transplantation, opportunistic infection prevalence varies geographically. Extraaxial infections, epidural, subdural, subarachnoid, ventriculitis, and meningeal, intraaxial, abscess, parasites, encephalitis, and demyelinating disease. Thank you all very much for listening.